Welcome to the Discover Alaska Lecture Series, brought to you by UAF's Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning. My name is Althea St. Martin, and I'm your host for this summer series. Discover Alaska is in its 15th season and was held on the UAF campus. The COVID-19 pandemic and social distancing guidelines required that we rethink the format for the series. We are delighted that KUAC has agreed to support this new format as a weekly TV broadcast. Thank you, KUAC. Each Wednesday night over the course of the summer, KUAC will air a talk by a local community member on a range of Alaskan topics. We are grateful to our speakers who are incredibly flexible in adjusting to this new format, and we appreciate the time they are donating to help us all learn more about our great state. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I wanted to let you know that you can view the talks online later by going to UAF Summer Sessions website at uaf.edu backslash summer, backslash events. I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker, Aditi Shinoy, who will discuss invasive plants in Alaska. She'll talk about some of the important invasive plants to look out for in Alaska, and also how they're being managed in Alaska, early detection, and rapid response to the Elodia infestation in the state, and what you can do to help. Aditi grew up in Bombay, got her master's in ecology, at Ohio State and worked in California in Oregon on invasive plants and forest ecology before moving to Alaska in 2007. She did her PhD at UAF on fire severity effects of the boreal forest succession. She has been working on invasive species management and other natural resource issues at the Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District since 2014. Thank you, Aditi for sharing your expertise with us. Hi everyone, my name is Aditi Shinoy. Um, I work at Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District on invasive plant management in interior Alaska. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you today about invasive plants in Alaska. So I'll first talk about what invasive plants are and why they matter. Um, I'll talk about what land managers in Alaska are doing about invasive plants. Um, I'll tell you the story of um, a case study of invasive plant management um, of Elodia, an aquatic invasive plant in interior Alaska. Um, I'll show you some high priority invasive plants that you should be on the lookout for. Um, and then finally, what you can do to help to prevent the spread of invasive plants in Alaska. Uh, so first, some terms. Um, a non-native plant is one that has been um, introduced either intentionally or accidentally from uh, into a geographic region where, uh, which is outside of its native range. Um, not all introduced plants are able to survive in the new environment. Um, an invasive plant is a non-native plant which has been introduced and is able to not only survive but also establish, spread and um, form a self-sustaining population in the new environment um, and often have negative impacts on native ecosystems. Uh, weed is a term that's commonly used interchangeably with invasive plant. Um, and the simplest definition of a weed is any plant that's growing in a place where it's not wanted. So for example, in this uh, peony farm over here, uh, peony is the desirable crop. And so the dandelions and horsetails would both be considered weeds in that situation. A noxious weed is an invasive plant which is known to have uh, harmful effects on um, ecology, economy, or public health um, in its introduced environment. Non-native plants that become uh, good invaders usually have attributes that allow them to um, uh, spread pro prolifically um, and um, grow and establish in their new environment successfully. Uh, so they often produce um, large amounts of viable seed which can be transported over long distances um, by water or wind. Um, they have persistent seed banks, which allows them to establish successfully. Um, and they're able to grow in a wide variety of soil conditions. Uh, they usually love growing in disturbed areas. Um, invasive plants that reproduce by seed as well as vegetatively are extremely difficult to get rid of because they can re-sprout from uh, fragments of stem or root. Um, and they're usually aggressive competitors for resources by having uh, deep and often um, extensive root systems. So they can deplete soil, nutrients, and um, water, and outcompete native, native plants. So it's important to note that not all non-native plants are invasive. 
for instance, lamb squatter, which is probably familiar to most of you, um, is non-native in Alaska, um, but it has been around for decades and is widespread in populated areas and disturbed areas. But it doesn't um, invade into intact native communities and it doesn't, isn't known to have any negative impacts on native ecosystems. Uh, bird vetch, on the other hand, is um, a highly invasive plant. It's able to invade and establish in intact forest um, and it can smother and outcompete um, native tree seedlings and shrubs. Um, on the flip side of that, native plants can be weedy as well. Um, back to that peony farm with the dandelion and the horsetail. Um, dandelion is a non-native weed, but horsetail is native, but it's as much of a weedy species as dandelion in this situation. Um, and any gardener can attest to the fact that um, even the most delightful Alaskan plant like fireweed or arctic rose can be a pesky weed if they're growing next to your broccoli or carrots. Um, so in Alaska, it's, it had long been thought that um, uh, the landscape was relatively immune to um, non-native plant invasions uh, because of its relative geographic isolation, uh, the inhospitable climate, so long cold winters, cold soils, and short growing seasons. Uh, but in recent decades, with the increase in um, tourism and commerce and trade into the state, uh, leading to more introductions of non-native species, as well as the warming climate, so warmer soils um, and longer growing seasons, are allowing more of these non-native species to successfully establish and spread um, into native ecosystems in Alaska. Um, this map shows uh, detections of non-native species in Alaska that were recorded in the 1920s. So you can see they're concentrated in Fairbanks um, and Anchorage and a couple other areas that are populated. Um, this is the same uh, map of um, non-native species detections in the 70s. Um, and so you can see that they're starting to spread um, again in the populated areas along road systems. Um, and this is uh, 2019. Um, there's well over 150 uh, non-native species that have been detected and they've spread all the way to the north along the Dalton Highway into the western parts of the state. Um, still limited mostly to populated areas and along roadsides. Um, so there are a number of ways in which um, non-native species can become introduced into the state. Um, transportation and tourism uh, can bring hitchhikers uh, in which can then become established. Um, horticultural products often have um, invasive weed uh, contamination, um, as do ornamental plants which are grown in uh, gardens and parks, um, and some of them turn out to be invasive and can escape cultivation. Uh, importation of hay, crops, and grass seed is also a common pathway for uh, non-native plants to become introduced into the state. Uh, and finally, invasive aquatic plants can be introduced through the aquarium trade. So once um, non-native or invasive plants are introduced into the state, um, as, as you saw from the map earlier, they're mostly concentrated in urban centers, but there are a number of pathways by which they can spread from populated areas into more remote parts of the, of the state. Um, roads are a really good conduit for uh, the dispersal of invasive plants into remote parts of the state uh, because they, they often tend to be disturbed uh, due to maintenance um, and provide a really good habitat in which um, they can spread. Um, remote construction projects which involve uh, bringing in fill material, um, equipment and um, other heavy machinery can often spread weed seeds um, or uh, invasive plants uh, into remote parts of the state. Um, outdoor recreation. Um, you can carry weed seeds um, or even parts of plants on your, just on your hiking boots or um, on your gear or outdoor vehicles and carry them into um, areas where we recreate. Um, and then ornamental shrubs and trees that are planted in gardens and parks. Uh, some of them, like bird cherry, um, can turn out to be invasive and escape cultivation and uh, become established in intact communities. So why do we care about the the um, spread of invasive plants in Alaska. Well, invasive plants can outcompete native plants um, and sometimes displace them. Uh, they can fundamentally alter and transform the native ecosystem structure and function. 
um, they can uh, um, reduce native biodiversity and uh, even lead to the extinction of rare and threatened endemic species. Um, and this, these changes to the composition of the native community can um, result in a loss of um, habitat that our native fish and wildlife species are uh, dependent on for food. Um, this then has cascading impacts on um, subsistence activities in the state, like hunting and fishing, can hinder recreational activities, um, and can have lasting impacts on natural resources um, and the economy of the state. Um, certain invasive species like giant hogweed, which is found in the southeast, uh, can also be a public health hazard. Um, it, it exudes a chemical that um, causes really bad chemical burns. The spread of an invasive plant um, in the new environment uh, can, is comparable to the spread of disease um, in a population. And since we're currently in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, I figured this is something everyone could relate to. Um, this graph here shows time along the x-axis and area infected by the invasive plant along the y-axis. Um, the management decisions that are available to land managers depends on where the plant population is along this curve. Um, so for instance, um, before the invasive species is present in the environment, the best management action that could be taken is to prevent its introduction. Um, <clears throat> well, after the invasive species has been introduced, um, but its numbers are still small and it has only affected a small number of sites, um, eradication of that species is possible. Um, once the um, species increases in abundance and occupies more and more uh, parts of the landscape, um, er eradication may um, become infeasible or um, prohibitively expensive. Um, and at that point, um, uh, invasive plant management is focused on containing the infestations um, to um, urban areas and limiting their spread into more rem remote parts of the state. Um, and then finally, when the species becomes so widespread and abundant that it has occupied um, a very large area, uh, the main uh, management actions that can be taken are resource protection and long-term management. In Alaska, we are still in a position where we can act to prevent um, large-scale economic damage that can be caused by uh, invasive plants. So what are we doing about invasive plants in Alaska? Um, as I showed you earlier, most of the uh, invasive plant species that we have here are concentrated along roadsides and uh, populated centers, but there are some species that are highly invasive and that have been um, uh, causing negative impacts in intact native ecosystems. So the overarching goal of land managers in Alaska is to protect Alaska's pristine landscapes and natural resources from the negative impacts of invasive plants. And this can be done by um, taking actions to prevent the spread of invasive plants from urban areas to wilderness areas, um, to detect new infestations early and rapidly respond uh, to those infestations with the appropriate management actions, um, and to work hard at preventing new introductions. Alaska is a patchwork of um, federal, state, native, and private lands. Uh, needless to say, invasive plants don't care about land ownership and can grow just as well on um, federal land, private land, or state land. And so cooperation, communication, and coordination amongst land landowners across boundaries is essential for um, successful management of invasive plants. The Alaska Invasive Species Partnership is a statewide group that uh, provides a forum for just this. Um, the, the members consist of representatives from various state and federal agencies, um, nonprofits, soil and water conservation districts, uh, tribal governments, um, as well as uh, researchers from the university and private citizens. Um, members of the group have formed ad hoc committees and task forces to deal with various invasive species issues, including um, uh, control and uh, management of invasive species. Um, outreach and education campaigns, um, early detection, uh, research on the impacts of invasive plants, um, as well as working with policy, policy makers um, to help shape um, invasive species legislation in the state. 
Um, a variety of um, state, federal, and nonprofit organizations um, are working on the various phases of invasive plant management, um, which are prevention, detection, control, and management, and research. Um, so, for instance, um, agencies like DOT and BLM have plans to implement best management practices and using weed free materials to uh, prevent the spread of invasive plants during construction and restoration projects. Uh, the DNR Division of Ag conducts inspections um, and regulation of noxious weeds and quarantines for high, high priority invasive plants. Um, uh, soil and Water Conservation Districts, uh, the National Park Service and uh, Fish and Wildlife Refuges um, often have strike teams that conduct inventory and monitoring of invasive plants in the landscape uh, in order to detect uh, new in invasive plant infestations. Um, a number of groups work in collaboration to conduct early detection um, and eradication programs of invasive plants. Um, and then there's a lot of research going on at UAA and UAF on the impacts of invasive plants on nat native ecosystems, as well as research on um, new methods to control invasive plants. Um, and these are just a couple of examples of the work that's going on around the state uh, to deal with invasive plant issues. Any good invasive plant management plan um, takes an integrated pest management approach, or IPM. Um, IPM is a common sense approach to dealing with um, invasive plant issues. Um, it involves a series of um, steps, evaluations, and decisions to arrive at uh, the most reasonable um, management plan that takes care of the invasive plant infestation with minimal impact on human health, the environment, and non-target organisms. Um, it usually involves um, first pest identification, um, assessment and uh, mapping of the extent of the infestation, and then uh, evaluating the various control options that are available. Um, strategies for management um, include prevention um, and physical, mechanical, biological, or chemical control of invasive plants. Often a combination of methods is used um, depending on the situation. If you'd like to learn more about um, IPM, um, I recommend that you uh, visit the UAF Cooperative Extension Services um, Integrated Pest Management Program website, where they talk about the services that they provide to landowners, as well as uh, lots of education materials on IPM. The Alaska Exotic Plants Information Clearinghouse, or ACEPIC, um, is a statewide uh, database that is uh, run by the UAA's Alaska Center for Conservation Science. Um, it has a mapping application which is available online um, with which you can um, look at what invasive species have been uh, detected and recorded um, over the years in your region. Um, it's an excellent tool for uh, invasive plant managers to get a handle on what species are present in their areas um, as well as the extent of the infestations. Um, and this is updated every year with um, new data that's collected by teams on the ground. Um, they also have um, an exhaustive non-native uh, plant species list of um, species that are invasive in Alaska as well as some that um, are invasive but haven't arrived in Alaska as yet, so it's really useful. Um, they've ranked um, the invasive plants uh, based on a number of different traits, um, reproductive traits, invasiveness, as well as climate suitability. And so it's a great tool for uh, land managers to help evaluate the potential invasiveness um, and negative impacts that a species could have on native ecosystems. The Alaska Weed Free Materials Programs are um, a voluntary inspection program that is run by uh, the DNR's Alaska Plant Materials Center in collaboration with soil and water conservation districts. Um, it's an excellent way to prevent the spread of um, invasive plants into more remote areas during construction projects, um, as well as uh, for things which require the use of straw, like, for, uh, like dog mushing races. Uh, so there's a weed-free forage program and a weed-free gravel program. Um, the way it works is that um, producers um, of either forage or gravel um, can ask for um, a certified inspector 
uh, to visit the material site um, and scout for uh, prohibited invasive species. Um, if they do have invasive plants on the material site, then they're required to um, control them before the plant material site can be certified as uh, weed free. Um, and once they have that certification, they now have a value-added forage product or gravel product which is available to uh, consumers. If you'd like to learn more about this program, um, visit the Alaska Plant Materials Center um, or contact the statewide um, Invasive Species Coordinator. I'd now like to tell you about the story of Elodia management in interior Alaska. Um, Elodia is um, a submerged aquatic invasive plant, which is non-native in Alaska. Um, it can be identified by uh, leaves which are arranged in whorls of three around the stem. The stems tend to be long and brittle, um, and it has long silky roots. Uh, it usually grows in really dense mats where it becomes established. Um, it's a common plant in aquaria and in high school biology kits and was most likely introduced in the, in the state through an aquarium dump. Um, it's the first um, and so far the only submerged aquatic invasive plant that's present in the state. Um, Elodia has a number of traits that makes it a really good inv invader. Um, it has brittle stems which break into fragments really easily and these fragments, plant fragments um, can stay viable in cold water for really long periods of time, so it can be transported to distant locations. Um, it's cold tolerant, so it continues to photosynthesize under the ice um, during the winter when the native plants die back, which gives it an advantage over them, um, and it reproduces vegetatively. Um, so what that means is that one fragment of elodia that's transferred from uh, one water body to another is all that's needed to start a new infestation, so it can spread really easily. Uh, the main vectors for spreading elodia are um, passive water movement, if, it's, uh, if it has infested um, a stream or a slough. It can be spread by boats and trailers, um, by fishing gear in the summer and winter, um, by wildlife, um, and by float planes. Once elodia becomes established um, in a water body, it grows in really dense mats. Um, it increases the sedimentation rates in streams um, and reduces uh, native biodiversity. It outcompetes native plants. And all of these factors um, combine to uh, really degrade uh, the stream habitats that, stream and lake habitats that salmon require for um, rearing and spawning. Um, it creates a safety issue for float plane and boat navigation. Um, and all of this has cascading effects on the fisheries economy, recreation and property value in the state. As of 2019, um, there were seven um, Elodia infestations that we know of in interior Alaska. Um, so this map shows Fairbanks up here, uh, the Tanana River flowing past Fairbanks. This is the community of Nanana along the, the highway. Um, and then the Tanana continues to flow down into the Yukon a couple hundred miles away. So the first infestation of Elodia was found in China Slough in 2010. Um, shortly after that, it was discovered in China Lake and a couple small patches in the China River. Um, in 2015, we found Elodia in Tochakit Slough, which is a remote slough uh, downstream of Nanana. Um, and in 2018, it was found in Manly Hot Springs Slough uh, Bathing Beauty Pond and Birch Lake. Um, so I'll go through the timeline of um, Elodia management in interior Alaska from when it was first detected in 2010. So it was first detected, like I said, in China Slough, which flows through the city of North Pole. Um, it was um, almost definitely introduced through an aquarium dump, and by the time the infestation was discovered, um, it had infested 118 acres, uh, about 10 miles of the slough. Um, shortly after that discovery, um, a number of state, federal and local agencies, as well as the Fairbanks Soil and Water Conservation District, um, coalesced and formed uh, the Fairbanks Elodia Steering Committee to deal with this issue. Um, in 2011, um, DNR, along with Fairbanks Soil and Water, conducted um, surveys of lakes and streams 
in the Fairbanks and North Pole areas. Um, so the blue water bodies on the map indicate places where they looked for Elodia and didn't find it. Um, and the red indicates areas where they looked for it and did find it. Um, so as of 2011, Elodia had been found in China Lake, China Slough, um, and then parts of the China River. So in 2011, the committee um, assessed the control options that were available for dealing with Elodia. Uh, this included doing nothing about it, uh, mechanical methods of control, um, chemical methods using herbicide, um, and engineering methods. They decided to test um, mechanical methods um, using suction dredging and um, divers. So Fairbanks Soil and Water in partnership with um, Test the Waters Dive Shop in North Pole um, conducted suction dredging trials um, over two seasons from 2012 to 2014 in China Slough. Um, so they built a, this modified suction dredge on a barge and used a diver to um, uh, suck up the elodia uh, with a hose and then collected it in the dredge mechanism. Um, after two seasons of uh, these trials, they found that this wasn't really a feasible method to tackle very large infestations of elodia, uh, but it could be used for um, spot treatment of small patches. It was just too difficult to, to, or impossible to um, harvest all of the vegetative material, um, especially since a lot of the plant parts are in the sediment that it collects. Um, in 2014, Elodia was detected in another part of the state, on the Kenai Peninsula, in a handful of lakes. Um, the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge, in a bid to protect um, the lakes on the refuge from being infested with Elodia from the infested lakes, um, conducted a really rapid assessment of um, lakes on the Kenai Peninsula to get a handle on the infestation. Um, they found it in three or four lakes, um, and then they acted really rapidly to um, begin eradication of Elodia using the aquatic herbicide Floridon. In 2015, um, Elodia was found in Lake Hood, which is one of the most um, busy floatplain bases in the world. Um, so similar to the Kenai uh, Peninsula infestation, this was also treated um, very rapidly shortly after detection. So a little bit about Floridon. Um, Floridon is an aquatic herbicide that is really effective at um, killing Elodia at very low concentrations of five to eight parts per billion in the water column. Um, it's systemic, so it's absorbed through the roots and shoots of the plants and it blocks photosynthesis. Um, it's, it uh, binds very tightly to the sediment in the stream, so uh, there's a very small chance of it migrating past two inches of sediment. Um, so there's really no risk of it moving into groundwater and migrating um, into wells. Um, it has low toxicity to non-target organisms, including fish, macroinvertebrates, and wildlife. Um, some of the native plants, native aquatic plants, um, do get affected by Floridone, but they grow back the following season from the seed bank. Um, and there are no restrictions on swimming, fishing, or drinking water that contains Floridone, up to 150 parts per billion, so, which is um, orders of magnitude greater than the five parts per billion at which we're, which we're applying um, for the treatments. In the wake of the detections of Elodia on the Kenai Peninsula and Lake Hood, uh, DNR, DEC, and Fish and Game um, coalesced and signed an MOU that recognized DNR as the lead agency for dealing with freshwater aquatic invasive plants in the state. Um, and the goal, the man management goal was um, statewide eradication of Elodia through coordinated interagency effort. In 2014, uh, DNR established a quarantine for five aquatic invasive plants, including Elodia. Um, and that made um, the sale of Elodia within the state or transport of Elodia into the state or around the state illegal. Um, back up in interior Alaska in 2015, um, foresters from Tanana Chief Conference um, accidentally found Elodia in Tochakit Slough and they were there for forestry work. Um, Tochakit Slough is um, a remote slough, it's about 20 miles uh, downstream of Nanana along the Tanana River. Um, it's a really important slough for subsistence uh, fishermen and hunters in the area. Um, 
when it was found, um, the Elodia had already filled up 230 acres of the slough and was very dense infestation. Um, so after that discovery, we decided to jump in a boat and um, with the help of NPS and Fish and Wildlife, um, surveyed a bunch of lakes and sloughs um, in the Fairbanks and Delta areas, uh, but also sloughs uh, downstream of Fairbanks um, along the Tanana and then downstream of Nanana uh, to get a handle on where else Elodia might, might have spread to. Uh, we didn't find any more infestations in 2015. Um, and so the committee made the decision to um, eradicate the existing infestations in China Lake, China Slough, and Tochacket Slough um, using fluoridone. So from 2015 to 2016, um, we developed the integrated pest management plan for um, managing, eradicating Elodia in interior Alaska. I uh, worked on the environmental assessment um, and the pesticide use permitting process through DEC. Um, since China Slu um, runs through neighborhoods and is lined by houses, um, we went through an extensive public process um, in the city of North Pole with landowners along the slough. Um, we had um, several public meetings and um, individual meetings with landowners on various issues related to the treatment. Um, many of the landowners um, were instrumental in the success of um, the the Elodia treatments and were really kind in allowing us to use their property for um, staging and equipment. In 2017, we finally put in the first um, herbicide treatment in China Slough to begin eradicating Elodia um, in coordination with DNR and Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, the treatment is working really well. So the map on the left shows um, an Elodia survey in the slough in 2017 prior to the first herbicide treatment. The red dots indicate places where um, Elodia is present. Um, just one year later in 2018, uh, the same survey re revealed um, only two areas of the slough where we could even find any Elodia. So all of the dense tangled mats of Elodia from the slough had been killed by that first round of um, herbicide treatment. Um, each year we monitor uh, stream stage and discharge in China Slough as well as water quality parameters, uh, macroinvertebrate and fish populations. Um, and we tested um, five private wells um, each year for fluoridone. Um, we started herbicide treatment um, of the Elodia infestation in China Lake in 2019 um, as well as in Bathing Beauty Pond. Um, and we will be treating Manly Hot Springs, Slough, and Birch Lake uh, this year. Um, and in the small patch of Elodia in the China River, uh, Test the Waters um, has divers volunteering to um, dive and mechanically control um, the small patches of Elodia um, that are present there. Um, so as of this year, we would have treated all of the known infestations of Elodia in interior Alaska. Um, alongside treating the existing infestations, um, we do surveys in partnership with uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, each year. Um, early detection surveys looking for uh, infestations of Elodia in sloughs along the Tanana, um, in float ponds and lakes on national wildlife refuges, um, in some of the Fairbanks area float ponds um, and lakes and streams, um, and other vulnerable water bodies in the region. Um, and this year we hope to make it down to um, sloughs off the Yukon River and hope that Elodia hasn't spread that far. So um, we worked with a number of different um, groups and partnered with a number of different groups um, on this project. Um, I worked with float plane pilots on um, spreading the word about Elodia as well as uh, looking for Elodia at places where they fly to. Um, we installed signage at boat launches to uh, make users aware of uh, the issue of Elodia and, and how to prevent spreading it by uh, clean draining and drying your equipment. Um, so all of this Elodia management in Deer, Alaska was um, accomplished through a lot of collaboration um, across agencies, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, DNR, um, Soil and Water Conservation District, DEC, NPS, um, the float plane pilots and public help with early detection 
Um, and then private landowners as well as Parks and Rec and Fish and Game provide logistical support. Um, and Test the Waters um, has divers volunteering to help with dive surveys as well as manual control of Elodia. Um, just to give you an idea of what's happening in the rest of the state, um, these are all the locations where Elodia has been found to date in Alaska. So there are several lakes and streams in Cordova where uh, research and treatment is ongoing. A handful of lakes on the Kenai Peninsula uh, where it has been eradicated from most of them and a couple of uh, new infestations are being treated. Um, and then Alexander Lake and Saka Lake complex um, on the Matsu are being treated. Um, several areas where it's been eradicated in Anchorage um, and then the se seven water bodies in the interior Alaska area which I just talked about. Um, this was just a slice of um, Elodia management in Alaska. There are several organizations and um, entities that are working on various aspects of um, not only management of the infestation, but also research on the effects of Elodia on native ecosystems, um, as well as researching cutting edge uh, methodologies for surveying for Elodia. Um, and it really is a great example of um, coordination um, collaboration and cooperation amongst um, stakeholders across the state in dealing with an important invasive plant issue. Uh, moving on from Elodia back to terrestrial plants, um, another project on early detection and control um, that we work on um, every year with um, the Yukon Flats National Wildlife Refuge um, is uh, surveying for and controlling any high priority invasive plants that might have become introduced to villages along the Yukon River as well as uh, some that are near it, Birch Creek, Chalkeetsik and Venati. Um, so we have uh, done um, invasive plant surveys in each of these villages. Uh, white sweet clover is probably the um, most invasive um, plant that we found um, in all of these villages. Um, and uh, we try our best to control it manually um, and especially hand pulling it along the river's edge to prevent it from spreading uh, down the Yukon River. Um, the seeds can stay viable in water for a long time um, and then they can invade um, gravel bars where they outcompete willows and uh, negatively impact moose habitat. Um, we also do outreach when we go out there, so we organize a little weed smackdown in Fort Yukon and had um, some of the locals come out and help us pull weeds. So I'd like to now show you um, just a handful of the high priority invasive plants in Alaska that you can look out for. Uh, white sweet clover I just talked about. Um, it's extremely prolific. It produces um, over 300,000 seeds per plant, which can stay viable in the soil for 80 years. So it's very difficult to get rid of once it gets established. Um, you can see it forms really dense uh, monospecific cultures um, and spreads really easily in gravel and along roadsides. Um, yellow sweet clover has, uh, is very closely related. It has yellow flowers, but it's very similar. Um, so white, it's really important to prevent white sweet clover from um, spreading into more remote areas because, as I mentioned, it could spread down rivers and invade um, gravel bars on glacial, on glacial rivers. Uh, bird vetch, I'm sure everybody is familiar with because it has completely covered Fairbanks. Um, it's, it has long um, climbing, trailing stems. It's a vine um, and narrow leaflets with coiling tendrils. Um, it has these pretty blue-violet flowers that the bees love. Um, and it reproduces by seed as well as vegetatively by rhizomes, making it difficult to get rid of. Um, it can um, invade intact native forests and it uh, smothers uh, tree seedlings as well as shrubs and saplings. Um, bird vetch is listed noxious in Alaska. Perennial south thistle is another one that unfortunately has been increasing in the Fairbanks um, area in recent years. Um, it has these yellow uh, flowers, it's in the Asteraceae family. Um, it can grow up to six feet tall and has really extensive 
deep um, root system. Um, it depletes soil water and nutrients and outcompetes native plants um, and can host um, other plant pests. Um, it's a common contaminant in um, hay, uh, hay and forage products. Um, and south thistle is also listed noxious in Alaska. Uh, creeping thistle hasn't become as extensive, but it's a really good one to keep an eye out for because we don't want it to uh, become a problem in interior Alaska. Um, a few areas, um, it has been detected in a few areas where it has been taken care of in the Delta region as well as up the Dalton Highway. Um, it has these purple flowers with um, spiny lobed leaves. Um, it reproduces by seed as well as um, vegetatively from lateral roots and root and stem fragments. Um, it can outcompete native plants, um, produce allelopathic chemicals. Um, and as a host for plant pests. Um, so this is one we really don't want to become more prevalent in interior Alaska, and it's listed as a prohibited noxious weed in Alaska. Um, orange hawkweed is um, prevalent in South Central and Kodiak, um, but has not made its way up to interior Alaska as yet. So that's another one to keep an eye out for when you're out adventuring. Um, it has these pretty orange flowers. It's a perennial herb. Um, it has narrow elliptical leaves, um, and the stems and leaves exude a milky sap. Um, this too establishes dense monocultures and can invade um, natural areas and rangelands, um, outcompeting native species um, and ruining the forage value of uh, native rangelands and pastures. European bird cherry and choke cherry, everybody's favorite um, ornamental tree. Um, this has been a really popular ornamental in Alaska for decades. It grows really well up here. Um, and I'm sure everyone thinks of uh, the fragrance of uh, choke cherry blossoms as, as the definitive smell of Fairbanks in the summer. Um, and then everyone loves making jams and jellies out of the, out of the berries in the fall. Unfortunately, choke cherry and bird cherry have been found to be extremely invasive. Um, birds eat the fruits and then deposit the seeds along riverbanks. Um, and from there, they can spread um, through rhizomes um, as well as by seed. Um, so they form a dense monoculture along riparian areas, outcompeting the native um, willows and alders. Um, and they've also been found to um, invade into intact forest um, ecosystems, um, interior Alaska and South Central. Um, so they can really ruin um, moose habitat, um, and they also impact uh, salmon habitat. Um, so a study showed that uh, the number of insects that um, fall into the stream from native uh, tree and shrub species um, is a lot more uh, than the number of insects that are supported um, by uh, choke cherry, and so it alters the nutritional input to streams, and that's a really important food source for migratory fish species like salmon. Um, certain plant parts also contain cy cyanogenic glycosides, which, um, if consumed at certain times of the year, have shown to be toxic to moose. So if you have a choke cherry tree in your yard, you might want to think of letting it go. <laughs> um, a couple of aquatic invasive plants which um, are common exotic aquarium plants uh, have, not, uh, have not yet been um, found in Alaska, um, but are extremely invasive and are costing millions of dollars to uh, take care of in the lower 48, are um, hydrilla, uh, Eurasian water milfoil, and Brazilian elodia. Um, all of these form uh, really dense tangled mats um, and can choke up waterways. Um, and we really don't want to have to deal with um, any of these in Alaska. Um, so if you see anything that looks um, like um, any of these three plants, um, please report them. So what can you do to prevent the spread of invasive plants in Alaska? Well, first, you can educate yourself on identifying invasive plants. Uh, there's a number of great resources that are available um, online. 
Um, there's a great book, Invasive Plants of Alaska. Um, the Alaska Plant Material Center has a good field guide on um, terrestrial weed identification. Um, and then the Forest Service has a little booklet on selected invasive plants of Alaska, which is handy. Um, and then the ACAPIC website, which I mentioned earlier, is also a great place to um, get information about identifying invasive species. Um, there's a collaborative uh, effort by the UAF, uh, Cooperative Extension Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, the Forest Service uh, to produce the Alaska Weeds ID app, um, which you can download on your phone. It's really handy. Um, so you can take a picture of um, a, a plant, if you're unsure of what it is, um, and upload it um, to the website. Um, and it also has a number of different um, aquatic um, grasses, herbs, forbs, shrub and tree, um, invasive species on there to help you with identification. Um, the Cooperative Extension IPM program has a citizen scientists portal. Um, so you too can be a first detector. Um, so you can uh, report unusual pest sightings um, while you're gardening or out adventuring. Um, don't plant a problem species. Um, everybody loves uh, pretty shrubs and flowers um, and trees, uh, but there are several of those that are really harmful invasives if they escape cultivation. Um, so the Cooperative Extension has a good um, publication on what not to plant in Alaska and then um, alternative native species that you can plant instead. You could organize a neighborhood weed pull. Um, so this was us with our weed smackdown um, at the Fairbanks Dog Park in 2019. Uh, we weren't able to do one this year because um, of COVID-19, but that shouldn't stop you from getting your neighbors together and um, pulling weeds in your backyard or in, on, the, on the roadsides um, in your neighborhood. Don't spread invasive species when you go out um, hiking. Um, it's really easy to carry invasive um, weed seeds um, on your boots um, or on your ATVs or boats. And so make sure that you clean all your gear um, before entering and after leaving um, a recreational site. Don't spread aquatic invasive species. Um, again, on your boats, uh, make sure that you clean, drain, dry your boats and trailers every time you use them. Uh, this applies to float planes and also fishing gear. Um, it's really easy for um, Elodia and other aquatic invasive species to spread by these means. Um, if you do see um, something that you suspect to be Elodia or any other invasive species, please call um, the statewide hotline um, or you can call your local extension agent or soil and water conservation district um, and report it. Um, and finally, um, you'll, there's a soil and water conservation district in uh, most regions of the state. Um, we partner with state, federal, tribal and private entities to tackle invasive plant issues. Um, we also work directly with private landowners on their invasive plant issues. We do site visits and recommendations. Um, we also do a lot of community education and outreach um, and stream bank restoration and revegetation projects. Um, we also do offer a weed cost share program which reimburses landowners for um, taking care of the weeds on their property. As so you can go to alaskaconservationdistricts.org to find your local soil and water conservation district. That's all I have for you. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Aditi, for your informative presentation and to KUAC for hosting the Discover Alaska Lecture Series. If you would like to see this lecture again or to let others know about it, you can find it on our website at uaf.edu backslash summer backslash events. Join us for next week's lecture with Ed Murphy presenting Going to Extremes, Diversity in Our Birds. I'm Althea St. Martin, and thank you for joining us as we discover Alaska. Have a wonderful evening and stay safe.